What's up, muggles, and welcome to another episode of Phantology. This is Steven, and today we're going to be reviewing Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the first book of the series by J.K. Rowling. Today I have Nathan and Dan. Yo, two, yo. Two How's guest it stars. going? Hey, Steven, I'm super pumped to talk about HP. Yeah, I'm super stoked to be here. All right, stoked to have you guys on the podcast. Before we get started, of note, if you like the content that Phantology Books is putting out, Check us out on social media at Phantology Books. You can also find us online at www.phantologybooks.com. And if you want to chat with us more, we have a Discord server and a Patreon account. And this is our 30th episode of Phantology, so we're excited to be hitting some of these milestones and having a great time putting out more content for everyone. Congrats on the 30th episode. So let's jump into the book, Harry Potter. It's, uh, it's something that we should all know about by now. Anyone who hasn't been living under a rock for the past 20 years knows about Harry Potter. The first book that we're going to be talking about was published in 97, right? So 23 years old? Yep. And as we get started, I want to ask you guys this question. What is it about Harry Potter that has made it into such a phenomenon? Because it completely took over the early 2000s and is still super popular today. Like anyone who is anyone has gone to a Harry Potter party, at least. So before we answer that question, can I just make it clear really quick? Because I know from the previous Phantology podcast that I listened to that you guys do a spoiler section, a spoiler free section. I know that we're talking about the first book, Sorcerer's Stone, specifically. But are we also talking about the series as a whole as we're answering this question and going through this podcast? I think we're just going to kind of go through the series. We're, we're going to focus our conversation on the first book. But spoilers for the rest of the series are fine because I think at this point, everyone's read Harry Potter. If you haven't, you're probably not listening to the podcast. So this is a, this is a legacy series that we're fine to completely spoil. One of the reasons why I think Harry Potter is such a phenomenon and everyone's heard about it and the books were so great and so out there was just because there's nothing, no books like it at the time that it came out in 97. Um, there is no wizarding world, no witchcraft, anything like that that I know of out there for young young adults or teenagers what, who the book was written for. Yeah, J.K. Rowling did a really good job of pulling from some of the earlier fantasy offerings that were out there like C.S. Lewis, like some Roald Dahl, uh, even some Jane Austen influences. So she pulled from a lot of stuff, a lot of mythology was also pulled into the books. And then she also was able to combine it with real world things like putting it into a school in England in a setting that everyone's familiar with. Yeah, wait, Stephen, can you explain more of the Jane Austen? Because yeah. I, I didn't catch any of the Jane Austen influence, but I might have just missed that. A lot of the, the way that she names characters is kind of similar to how Jane Austen names characters that, that hints at their, uh, their, their relevance later on in the series. And there are some things like the way that they gather together in a community to open letters, for example. That's a that's something that happens a lot in Jane Austen type novels. And then at the end of every book, when Harry has somewhat of a time to reflect upon what happened and they just do like a recap of everything and there's a feel good feeling at the at the end, that's also a Jane Austen type things. So I mean not not like a direct copy or anything, but there are those types of influences. Yeah, that's good to know. So when I look at Harry Potter overall I just think that it's we all really like a good hero story and we like seeing ourselves as the hero and it's easy to see ourselves um, to kind of project ourselves onto Harry and see our see us overcoming odds. Um, it's a really easy book to read because you know exactly who you're supposed to like, who you're supposed to dislike. And the main characters, while, while they are in very perilous situations that are fun, new and exciting, like Nathan talked about, you have an exciting new wizarding world. You also, it's also not, you never feel like they're in real, real danger. Like you kind of know what's going to come. So it's not too stressful to read. It's very enjoyable. Um, it kind of came at the perfect time. It's enjoyable for kids uh, as well as a lot of adults. So I think for all of those reasons, it was able to kind of take over the world. Nice. And I think we want to go through maybe some of those reasons in more detail. I've heard this hot take thrown out there that Harry Potter is overrated. The series is super vanilla. There's nothing too special about it. The characters are just caricatures of different uh, types of personalities. So how would you guys respond to that? Because I've, I've seen that 
kind of gaining some traction and there's some Harry Potter haters out there. Well, there's always going to be when you write a series that's this many books and as many words as J.K. Rowling did that covers so much time. There's going to be lots of plot pol- plot holes to nitpick at, myself included. I'm probably going to point out a lot during this podcast that bother me a lot. Her prose, a lot of people critique her prose. The way that she describes dialogue, she just says, Harry said this glumly. Ron responded enthusiastically. It's a, it's like a lot of so-and-so said this adverb, so-and-so said this insert other adverb. But I don't mind that as much because it kind of funnels your attention directly to the action and the narrative itself. And she doesn't get too deep into some of the more uh, niche literary skills. Steven, I probably explained that wrong. <laughs> no, that was that was a really good explanation. Her prose is very accessible, right? So it's written so young, adult, young adults can enjoy it, adults can enjoy it, and she kind of patterned this after C.S. Lewis's Narnia books, right? Where they're somewhat of young adult novels because there are kids off adventuring, but you never really feel kind of like how Dan said, you never feel like they're really in danger, like everything is going to be all right, even though events are not always going in our hero's favor. At the same time. There are more. There are some more adult themes explored. Some things that people of all ages can really latch onto. Yeah, for sure. One of my friends who doesn't like Harry Potter, going on with the Harry Potter overrated hot take, um, is he said that it's too much like the J, uh, the Tolkien series of Lord of the Rings, where you have a chosen one in in Frodo in that series who's going on a a quest of some sort, right? as is Harry, who's the chosen one to destroy the dark, evil emperor or whatever. You know, you could throw out anything there. And there's a lot of similar characters where you have a wizard to help him along the way, an old wizard, um, friends to help him as well. And so there's a lot of similar things that people say where it's kind of the same plot line of of Lord of the Rings, and that's why they don't feel the diversity there. Right. We call that plotline the hero's journey. The hero's journey is often where you have a orphan boy, somewhat of an underdog, going off on a journey. He's given some magical items by a mentor, a wizard type guy, and he goes off and overcomes obstacle after obstacle while he learns and grows and ultimately defeats the big bad. Star Wars is another great example of this. You have an orphan boy, Luke, who gets a lightsaber. He's taught by a wise mentor, Obi-Wan, who then perishes and leaves Luke to go off on his own. He meets up with friends. He defeats Darth Vader. He defeats the Emperor, right? So this is not a plot line that is foreign to anything. It's, it's something that we're very familiar with as readers, but I think that really plays in Harry Potter's favor. Yeah, I was going to say that a lot of us probably like to see ourselves as the underdog or that we're the victim of something that somehow we're not starting off on the even ground as someone else. And Harry Do- Harry Potter, I should say, is just a massive underdog story. I don't know if we want to start jumping into the plot or if you had some other background stuff, but the first 10 years of his life with the Dursleys, I can't think of a worse possible life. I mean, I guess he has the basic necessities. He's not starving. He actually lives in a house. So I, there's probably other fictional characters that might have it worse in that regard. But he has no positive human to human interactions whatsoever. And I think um, we like to see someone that is put in, in such a drastically bad situation overcome that. And that makes us feel good about ourselves too. Yeah, we can start getting into the plot. So you mentioned his upbringing with the Dursleys. I think this was very strongly influenced by some Roald Dahl books like Matilda, for example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically the same upbringing exactly. Like jerk parents who mistreat this somewhat precocious genius child. I mean, Harry's not a genius like Matilda, but he is a wizard. He can do magic. But he's totally just shunted off to the side in favor of Dudley, who has nothing remarkable about him at all. And these characters are just complete caricatures. They're total jerks. No one is like this in real life, but it kind of works for Harry Potter. Yeah, I mean, in his first 10 years, he his room is under the stairs in a cupboard. Yeah, serious child, abuse. serious child abuse happening here for Harry. So I'm wondering at this stage of his life, I want to introduce Dumbledore as a character. I don't think he's been talked about on the podcast yet. 
But I'm wondering, how do you leave the most famous, the wizard who defeated, how do you leave this prodigy wizard who somehow is able to defeat the Dark Lord, how do you leave him just neglected, totally abandoned with his evil, abusive aunt and uncle? How do you not send him any kind of care package, any kind of notice, like give him a glimmer of hope? Because during these 10 years, he could be getting severely psychologically damaged, could be irreparable. So I'm just wondering, how does Dumbledore not intervene at any point? I guess the series will tell you there's two reasons. One is he had to stay with the Dursleys because of some kind of magic that was imprinted on his family based off of the the way that his mother sacrificed himself, right? Because Voldemort was unable to touch him until he reached a certain age, as long as he continued to live with his family's blood. So that was why he had to live with the Dursleys and why he couldn't just go live with Sirius. Or, well, I guess Sirius was, an Az- was in Azkaban, but... That was why he couldn't live with another loving wizard family. But to answer your question about the care packages and psychological damage, I think, don't they kind of say that like they wanted Harry to live away from the wizarding world so he wouldn't be overwhelmed with fans and admirers and they wanted him to have a normal upbringing. But at the same time, like it's pretty easy to tell that he's not being treated well. Yeah, that those two statements are there part of the two big reasons why he didn't receive any help. Well, the main reason is because of the Voldemort, and even though he was defeated at this time, and I guess Dumbledore, it doesn't really explain it in depth, but one of the other reasons, just Dumbledore didn't want him to, because, I mean, he's famous in the wizarding world, and so he didn't want Harry to be super famous in given everything. He wanted him to be able to fight for stuff so he would be able to have that later on in his life. Maybe Dumbledore was selfishly worried that if Harry grew up famous, he would become a jerk child and wouldn't need his advice later on. But if we keep him, if we keep him down and make him require a mentor, then Dumbledore can be his mentor and mold him to finally defeat Voldemort. What do you think about that theory? Yeah, I could I could see it as him trying to stay relevant. Kind of paints Dumbledore as a bit of a jerk, making Harry's childhood suck so that he can he can uh, end up molding him into the hero once he's older. Early in the book, it does when they first leave him at the Dursleys, McGonagall is the one to point out to Dumbledore that he shouldn't leave Harry with them, with, with the Dursleys. But Dumbledore neglects McGonagall's advice. Yeah, that's true. McGonagall has been spying on them the whole time. This is in the very first chapter. And, he's like, and McGonagall tells Dumbledore, like, holy cow, these people are awful. And Dumbledore just kind of says, like, no, he needs to stay there and doesn't really go into reasons. Yep. So let's talk about Harry as a character a little bit more. He's kind of an interesting character because there's really nothing all that special about him other than he's weirdly good at Quidditch, totally middle of the ground in just about every other aspect. And I think that is almost the secret genius of the series because J.K. Rowling creates this blank slate of a character that readers can then project themselves onto And they can say, basically, I'm Harry. I'm the one going through the adventures. Because we kind of all see ourselves as somewhat of, I mean, most people, at least, I think, see themselves as somewhat of middle of the ground. Like, we have our talents, but we also are kind of hard on ourselves. So, personally, when I read Harry Potter, I think, wow, if Harry can do this, you know, I'm Harry at the same time. I'm having these adventures. And that's what makes it fun to be in this magical world. And you can just put yourself right there into the action. Yeah, along with that, I think it goes... Um, with any of the characters, really, or well, at least the kids in this series that are introduced, all the characters are good at one or two th- of the things that are good at school, good at some type of sport or something like that. Except for Ronald Weasley, kind of bad at everything. Well, I was going to say Anne Hermione, who's good at everything, except for athletic stuff, but there's only Quidditch to really prove yourself athletically. So, Yeah, be- what Ron in- is good at jokes, maybe? <laughs> no, that's jo- thing. Ron is easily outclassed by his brother. His brothers are 10 times funnier than him. Yeah, Ron's good at nothing. That's what his character is. So I guess maybe what you're trying to say is people of all walks of life can relate to at least one character. Yeah. Like if you're good at nothing, then relate to Ron. If you're good at everything, relate to Hermione. Yeah, I guess so. But Hermione is not good at everything. What's, what is Hermione not good at? Quidditch? That's one thing. Yeah. She's good at literally everything else. She's better like emotionally, mentally, just maybe not physically, but... That's fine. She doesn't have to be. I just don't think that she really has the time to devote to Quidditch. Is there any doubt that if she did, that she'd be really good? She at least earned a spot on the Gryffindor team? 
Yeah, if she had a time turner earlier in the series, maybe she could have gotten into Quidditch. If she came from a muggle family, so big disadvantage on the Quidditch pitch, even though Harry's not hampered by that at all. Kind of weird, but that's fine. We later find out that Ron, who grew up in a wizarding family, is not actually that great at, at Quidditch. Mm, I mean, see later books, Weasley is our king, anyone? <laughs> yeah, after he was tricked into drinking luck potion. One of my no no that was after that, that was after the Felix thing. I mean that's how he makes the team. But one of my favorite moments in the whole series is when they're carrying Ron back on their shoulders, singing Weasley is our is our king, and Harry doesn't know why. He thinks they're making fun of him, but he finds out that Ron has saved the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. Huge smile <laughs> yeah. broke out of my face as I was reading that. Yeah. Part. Anyway, Stephen, I agree with your Harry Potter is a blank slate observation. I personally am extremely impressed that he came out of like I said the first ten years of his life being as socially adept as he is and just like not as overall bitter towards the entire world like he still has maintained his natural curiosity and zest for life despite everything so i i consider that above average for him yeah he's exceptionally humble even when he finds out that he's the one that defeated voldemort and everything it never goes to his head at all wizards and witches are like fawning over him in diagon alley and his reaction is very much like hands off. He wants to stay away from from that fame right away. So th- that's, yeah, that's that's a good quality. And maybe that is just kind of ingrained in him because of the way he was brought up. I don't think you can have a chosen one that is super prideful and knows who he is right away. This gets at one of my favorite moments of the series when Hagrid first tells Harry that he is a wizard. And this is a great moment that the, the movies do a really good job of showing is Hagrid tells him he's a wizard and Harry says, I'm just Harry. You know, I, I can't be a wizard. I can't be the one who defeated Voldemort. And Hagrid says, well, just Harry, you know, come with me. You're a wizard and let's go off on all these adventures. But that just totally speaks to, I think, the, the readers and watchers of the movie, I guess, is we're kind of saying, oh, you know, I'm just Steven. I'm, I'm whatever. But, uh, but J.K. Rowling says, well, no matter who you are, come off with me on this adventure and that just sucks you right into yeah for sure that part is really funny because they go out after receiving countless numbers of letters hogwarts vernon dosley goes kind of crazy and they go off to an island and hagrid finally gets to him and yeah that seemed like a total roll doll type thing where they go off to this ramshackle house in the middle of nowhere and the dursleys are just going completely crazy that part was great i love the part as a kid Yeah, it had some good buildup. And as soon as you had the big reveal that Harry was a wizard, like you said, the story really takes off. Like when they start preparing for school and they get to go, this is personally my favorite part of the book, is when you get to learn um, like back to back to back, you get all of these new things that are part of the wizarding world. Like when Harry finds out, oh, you need to get a cauldron. Oh, you need to get a wand. Oh, and and we have these broomsticks that you can actually fly and we have this wizarding sport and then you have platform nine and three quarters and that whole, there's just a ton of reveals into the insights into the magical world that you get in just a couple of chapters. And that really sucks you in. Yeah. In the fantasy book world, we call this world building. So JK Rowling does a really good job of world building here because she's revealing a lot of things really fast, which, which can sometimes be bad in a book because if you info dump way too much stuff on a reader, it's going to make it... it it's going to make it hard for someone to jump into your brand new world if you say, oh, it's different in all of these ways and it's coming at you really fast and you don't really get a sense of, of exactly how things work. That makes it hard. But J.K. Rowling does a great job because she's blending the familiar aspects of fantasy with some, some things that are unique to the wizarding world. So we all know, as you know, as human beings living in the world, that there's witches and wizards and they use cauldrons and they use, they use magic wands and they use broomsticks, etc. That's all kind of familiar to us. But then we add in things like, oh, and there's Gringotts, and there's Galleons, and Sickles, and, and Knuts, and there's things that are really specific to Harry Potter, but we blend those things in with the classical tropes of wizards and witches. That makes it awesome. Yeah, did you guys think we, need as, Ed, we needed as many of the classical tropes? For example, do we really need the ghosts? Do we need unicorns? Do we need goblins? Do we need references to Merlin? And who's the girl? That's what the Morgana is who I'm trying to think of. Do we need all of that stuff? Because it just felt like a huge dump of every fantastical or magic reference to me. Yes. Yes, I think you do. And for the exact reason that I was just explaining is because those are the things 
that suck you in. If you're unfamiliar with all of the Harry Potter specific things, you can say, well, I know what witches and wizards are, and I know Merlin, and I know magic wands. So I like these things. And oh, look, Harry Potter's doing them. So okay, I'm kind of into this story too. And then you say, oh, and Harry Potter also does this new thing. Oh, okay, that's fine. I know that he knows these other things, and I, I like the other things. And so it just kind of sucks you in that way. It builds off of the familiar. One of the main things that I found questioning is Hagrid and Harry go and get all of his stuff for school, and then Harry has to wait a month until school starts. Yeah, that must have been the longest month <laughs> yeah. ever of Harry's yeah. life. Like, what's he, did he go back to the Dur- Like He obviously went back to the Dursleys, right? But like, what happened during that month? He was just in quarantine. Yeah, he was just social distancing during the month. I think during, doesn't it talk about how Dudley's kind of scared of him? And they just saw, like, stay away from him as much as possible. It was a great month for him. Yeah, it's only like a couple of pages that covers that entire month. So I don't think anything eventful happened at all. But I just remember when I was like 10 years old, waiting for something like Christmas break or for school to be out or something, a couple of weeks felt like an attorney. It felt like a year or something. So, yeah, I can't imagine anyone being as hyped as Harry would have been to leave the Dursleys and get to go to this magic school. Yeah, Harry's like probably thinking, oh, this is the greatest day of my life. I mean, personally, when I was about to turn 11, I was pretty hyped to maybe receive my letter. I was thinking, like, I knew Harry Potter wasn't really real, but at the same time, I was like, well, what if it is? Like, what if I'm a, what if I'm a, a mud blood and, and I'm going to get the letter and I'm going to go off to Hogwarts? It was kind of disappointing when that didn't happen. But I think a lot in, uh, in our generation maybe had those moments turning 11. Yeah, for sure. I, no, I didn't, guys. Uh, that's too bad. I guess you're just a muggle all the way through. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the plot elements of the book, I guess. So we've talked, we've talked through Diagon Alley, and Harry is now going off to school. And one of the first things that happens when he gets to school after meeting up with some friends is he's going to get sorted into his house, right? You have the four houses, yeah. Gryffindor, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, and Hufflepuff. And I know that you, Dan, have maybe a hot take about the sorting hat, maybe an issue that should have been addressed. But tell us your take on the sorting hat. Well, I don't think it's really a hot take as much of an observation, but the sorting hat is supposed to perfectly detect the innate characteristics of all these budding wizards and witches, and it's going to put them in one of the four houses. The problem that I have is there's five witches and five wizards per house per year. So you have, so what is that, 40? So there's 40 per year, right? 40 first years every year are the lucky ones admitted to Hogwarts. I guess everyone else has to choose Durmstrang or something. Yeah, so they go in alphabetical order. My issue is if you're an RSTUV, if your name's towards the end of the alphabet, what if all of the slots in your preferred house or your destiny house are already taken and you have to go to your second, third, fourth choice? What about the person? I I can't remember if any of the students' last name starts with Z, but they probably just end up in Hufflepuff, right? Or wherever has an open slot left over. Blaze, Blaze Zamboni. Yeah, Zabini, I think is the word. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that later replaces... One of the crab or goyle, forgot which one. Yeah, so anyway, I think it would be much better if the Harry Potter, or if the sorting hat got like a one minute stint with every first year before it made the official declaration, the official sorting. And then they could see, okay, this person has, for example, 30 Hufflepuff points, 40 Ravenclaw points, 60 Slytherin, 65 Gryffindor. And then it could go through and rank and pick the 10 highest Gryffindor, 10 highest Slytherin, and there could be some kind of algorithm. I mean, it is magic, but whatever the magical equivalent of like a coded algorithm to sort out properly the people into the four respective houses. Yeah, agreed. We need to be able to rank order people because there's no indication that the sorting hat knows anything about the person whose last name starts with Z when they start with whoever starts with A. And yeah, like you say, they could easily just take the, t- the first 10 could all go to Gryffindor if they're noble enough. And super noble guy with a, with a lower last name is not going to make it in. He's going to have to go to, I guess, Ravenclaw? I mean, honestly, the other houses would probably fill up. Is Hufflepuff just full of all of the T-U-V's, W's, X's, etc.? Yeah, yeah, that was my thought. Nathan, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking up, reconfirming what the, uh, who's all in Harry's year that's in Gryffindor. And seeing, like, the who went where in Harry's year. You're asking us to name Harry's cronies, Harry's Harry's friends in the first year? No, no, no. You, I mean, if you want to, you can. But I'm just reconfirming seeing the numbers. 
Well, you got Harry, Ron, Neville, Dean. Seamus. And Seamus are the five. Those are the five guys. Yeah, five guys. And the girls are Hermione. Lavender Brown. One of the Patel twins, Parvati. Parvati. Right? And yeah, two other girls. I don't it's know like who the two Alois other girls Midgen? are. Is Alois Midgen, is, that a, is she a Gryffindor? She's the one that has acne, right? They make fun of her? Yeah. Yeah, maybe the girls aren't as important in the in the first year. Harry doesn't notice them quite as much. Yeah, there's there's only there's only three that are confirmed throughout the series. The other two are no name. They're just creative players. Yeah. Okay, well I don't feel as bad as about not knowing their names then. Okay, so yeah, definitely issues with the sorting hat. What other issues do we have with Hogwarts? I know the the house cup system has been it's fun to read about. It's fun to think about a big system that we're all competing against, we're in different factions, we're all trying to get the prize at the end. But I feel like there's some issues with the way points are actually administered and definitely some issues with how Dumbledore just makes Gryffindor win at the end of every year. Yeah, he just gives points willy-nilly at the end of the book to Harry, Ron, and Hermione and then 10 points to break the tie to Neville. Yeah, it seems super biased. And well, besides that point, the House Cup to me, I'd, I think it's stupid. I think it's the points are just arbitrary. And it seems like only Snape and McGonagall are really taking away points or giving out points. So it's just if you suck up to them, you can win the House Cup. If I was a Hogwarts student and I was getting into like my third, fourth, fifth year, I think it would have dawned on me that the House Cup didn't really mean anything. And that there could be random blunders made by my housemates that could lose the entire House Cup for, um, for my team. And then I wouldn't really care as much. I think it's mostly like a first year, second year kind of thing that they get really that they really get into well what about this so you see the book through it's all through harry's eyes right so you're seeing house cup points being administered to harry and friends because that's what the book focuses on so there could be lots of house cup points being administered in other ways that you, we just don't know about because we're not seeing it through those lenses yeah the only points of consequence that we really see in the first book are when they go to the tower to what is it to get the dragon egg yeah they're sending off the dragon they're sending him right, off right. To, to Charlie, right? Yeah, and that's when they get their huge deductions, and then they get the points awarded like Nathan referred to in the banquet at the end of the year. Well, I bet there's other there's other students, like Fred and George, for example, probably lost a ton of points. There's going to be other outstanding students, maybe like an Oliver Wood. He probably earned a lot of points over his years, right? Yeah. Cedric Diggory probably got a lot of points for Hufflepuff. Yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, but they don't even... It doesn't... Unless I'm wrong, it doesn't really even mention what they win by winning the house cup just pride well they get their names etched on the the cup right yeah like the, it's like the stanley cup the the cup goes in the trophy case and they after they leave hogwarts and never see it again well it's all about pride at hogwarts i mean if you're at a school where you're divided up into four different houses and you're constantly competing and associating with those of another house if you have bragging rights over the other house that's got to be huge I could see some. I could see getting behind that even in my later years at the school. No, I like the idea of the house cup. I just don't like how the points are awarded. I think it should be a more uniform method that can be evenly applied. Well, you just have biased teachers and Snape and McGonagall. So it should be more like based off of performance on exams. Yeah. If you do super well, then you're going to earn points. There should be like a challenge, a challenge section of every lesson. Towards the end of the lesson, we're like, okay, these questions are for points, stuff like that. Maybe like some trivia competitions at the end. Seems like Hermione would get rack up all the points for Gryffindor then. Yeah, or why can't they adapt the model of the Triwizard Tournament, for example, and have a mini Triwizard Tournament just at a school level, and they could have varying intellectual challenges, physical challenges, uh, dual type of things? Yeah, I guess Hogwarts in general, and we can talk about this now, Hogwarts in general is just not organized very Not well. at all. There's crazy stuff going on at Hogwarts. It's not safe at all. I don't know how any wizarding parent sends their kid to Hogwarts and can really fully expect them to come back with all of their limbs at the end of the year because there's just so much unsafe stuff going on. They don't. I mean, they should have to sign a waiver to go to Hogwarts. Hogwarts is way more unsafe than Hogsmeade. Why do you have to sign a waiver to go to Hogsmeade if you can go to Hogwarts? Yeah, all the stairs that move around the Forbidden Forest. Yeah, them getting sent to detention in the Forbidden Forest stands out just as a joke. And then not only do they get sent with Hagrid, who is a questionable wizard to say, to they say the They go least. off by themselves. And then they, yeah, he splits them up. <laughs> and they're investigating a dangerous matter, right? Like these unicorns have been killed. 
we're gonna send the first years off with lanterns to it just seems like they're being sacrificed like what insights are the first years going to be able to provide even if they do stumble upon so well i guess they do end up helping but it seems really lucky yeah i mean without the centaurs they very well could have been completely taken out and going back to the waiver like just to play quidditch itself you need a waiver like i'm trying to imagine one of the wizards like take hermione like sending an owl home to her muggle parents to update them on Hogwarts and telling them about this new sport that she has learned about. And you have seven players on each team. Two of the players on each team are just, their whole role is to injure the other team that are flying at really high speeds, way above ground. And then, well, do we want to talk more about, I have some problems with Quidditch. Yeah, in this yeah, this scoring. is a good transition into Quidditch. Let's talk about Quidditch. Yeah, so the scoring just has to be fixed. The scoring just has to be fixed. You have seven players on the team, but only one of the players really matters. In 99, I'll give you 1% of the time, maybe your chasers will be good enough that you can outweigh the advantage of not finding the uh, snitch. So you think the quaffle, you think the quaffle is worthless? Absolutely. So the 1% of the time was the Kudish World Cup, like the largest yeah. competition ever. Where they beat the one of the greatest seekers in Victor Crumb. But was the only reason that actually happened in the books just so J.K. Rowling could say, look, Quidditch rules are not actually broken? There is a point to the quaffle? Because previously, I think, yeah, you have a lot of ground to stand upon when you say that's a completely broken system. So maybe she yeah. just wrote that in there in order to have something to point to to say, like, actually, no, the rules do make some sense. Oh, yeah. No, I totally think she's just trying to save face with that. Because, yeah, okay, my proposed scoring is also I think that there should be a timer. I think it's cool, the idea that the game could go on for several days. But you have to have a limit at some point. I'm just trying to be practical about this. Like people are going to have places to go eventually. Now that I think about it, was she just completely making fun of herself with the whole bet that Fred and George made or that Ireland would win, but Crumb would get the snitch? Like, I feel like she was just totally tongue in cheek mocking her own scoring system. I kind of like it now that I think about oh, it. Oh, yeah, way. that's a good point. I mean, Ron, Ron Weasley's the big out of the three main heroes. Ron is the big Quidditch fan. He talks with Harry about it several times throughout the books. Does he talk about issues with the scoring system, or does he just talk about his love for the Chudley cannon? No, he's just a blind follower. My recommendation is you put a 90-minute timer, and is that the same as soccer? Soccer's you got okay, the 245s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the 245-minute you, you got the extra time as well. Okay, so you put a 90-minute timer, catching the snitch. So if you catch the snitch, it gets re-released. So you get the opportunity to catch the snitch, the snitch multiple times. So you avoid the catastrophe of a game that happened in Harry's second career game where he caught the snitch in the first one minute and the game was already over. And that was probably the, the plan for most of the people for that day. Like I imagine some kind of tailgating environment, like people getting their scarves on, getting pumped. You go to the game and it's over in like a minute. That's a big letdown, right? So you avoid that scenario. Yeah. What are you going to do for the rest of the day after the minute long game is over? Yeah. It's like going, <laughs> going tailgating to a football or basketball game and leaving after the opening tip yeah so i mean let's be realistic about this let's put a 90 minute timer let's say each quaffle score is 10 points just like the original and each snitch capture it can still be really valuable it could be 50 points like that's definitely enough to decide a match but it, like i said it gets re-released so you could have zero snitch catches in the 90 minutes you could have multiple you could have one by each seeker i i like that a lot more i think it's i think it's a fair way to score any safety changes or just points? Is, is that the main issue? Well, despite the bludgers, I don't remember any... I, well, I do think that there's probably a lot of undocumented cases of CTE in the wizarding world. Like some 30, 40, 50-year-old wizards like all of a sudden losing their memory because they had some rough encounters with bludgers earlier in their life. Well, there is a Quidditch match where Harry falls off his broom to the ground. Oh, yeah. Or when the all the wood gets... It's obliterated by the bludger and falls off his broom. Yeah, that was just in the movie for dramatic effect. But but there is a, I think it's in his third year, right? Because all the Dementors. Yeah, 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 it's the Dementors. But Dumbledore saves him. Yeah, Dumbledore is able to save him. So is that the safety measure, just Dumbledore? <laughs> like we just trust that if anything really bad were to happen, Dumbledore would be able to stop yeah, it? Yeah, do you think Madame Pomfrey has like a Cerebro Reparo spell or something? Or there's got to be some kind of like barrier at about five, ten feet above the ground that slows you down. If you fall, hopefully that's a thing. How much does Madame Pomfrey get paid? That's the big question after yeah. how many times. She probably has to treat a, yeah, she treats a variety of injuries and ailments for sure. And she's the only 
Well, at least the only documented nurse or... Yeah, I kind of assume Dumbledore's like has some backup medical knowledge in case Madame Pomfrey isn't able to attend. What if Dumbledore's just gone? The guy randomly takes off to the Ministry of Magic at critical times. Yeah, like the first book or the all throughout the fifth. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I trust Dumbledore to really keep me safe. That's what people say, like, oh, I'm gonna send off my, my kid off to Hogwarts. Dumbledore will be there to make sure he's safe. Dumbledore's like not even at the school and he's totally hands off for large swaths of the books. Yeah, the teachers themselves, the professors have much more control over the students' actual experience in Hogwarts than Dumbledore does. And even in the second book where the basilisk is in Hogwarts and Dumbledore doesn't do anything. And he allows, Snape's behavior really bothers me, well, throughout the series, but in the first book, he's just a jerk right off the bat to Harry. And you don't know anything about the backstory at this point, so you don't know what his motives are. You just assume he's... And this, I guess this is why J.K. Rowling leans into this is because you dislike him and you assume that he's the evil person. But his bullying of Harry and the other Gryffindors just comes off as really childish and unnecessary. But Dumbledore's allowing it under his watch. Yeah, Snape's a debatable character. Some people are all about Snape and all about his, his redemption arc because it was all okay because he was really trying to protect Harry because he loved Lily. I'm a little less apologetic about Snape because I think it's a little weird that he's still that into Lily after her being dead for that many years. Like, can we find someone else maybe to focus our love on? It it seems weird to me. Yeah. But maybe we shouldn't get too into Snape because I know this is like a long it's, discussion. It's very hotly debated. Yeah, for sure. Wait, so do you guys like Quidditch? Going back to Quidditch, I didn't really get your guys' thoughts. I really like the idea of Quidditch. I think it's really really interesting sport the people that play it in real life are kind of kind of weird i would never see myself riding a broom running around oh you mean real real life yeah real real life in 2020 yeah okay well let's not insult many listeners of phantology who may be into real life quidditch i think it maybe it's fun like on a college campus or something but yeah definitely more fun on broomsticks in hogwarts if i was in harry potter like in the Wizarding World, I would I would definitely play Quidditch. I think Muggle Quidditch tests your athleticism way more than Wizarding Quidditch. Oh right, because you don't think wizards are athletic at all. Like no, they no. should be. They need to be more athletic, and it's not fair that Quidditch is the only sport. Well, yeah, considering Quidditch is the only sport, what other reason do they have to train their leg muscles? Like, do they ever go to the gym? Do they practice running, jumping, more traditional things like that? I don't I don't see that well, happening. They do at have all in to the walk up the flight of stairs in in Hogwarts. I mean, maybe, but the stairs kind of fly around and take you where you need to go, right? Well, not all the stairs. You can't get on the bottom stair in Hogwarts and have expect you to take it up to the top floor. I don't know. I played some Harry Potter video games, and you just hop on the stairs, and they take you where you yeah. want to go, man. But I will say, I think Harry and friends get a lot of workouts running from monsters. They're always running through the Forbidden Forest. They, they probably have some pretty good cardio. Yeah, they have a lot of adrenaline-induced physical Activity. Yeah, but your your average wizard who just goes to classes, lives a pretty sedentary life, yeah, they probably, are wizards just all overweight? They're always eating different chocolates and, and wizarding snacks. Maybe that's a hot take. Why are there not more fat wizards? Maybe there are like spells. Yeah, there could be dieting spells Yeah, that have your calories or something. That's always something that I wish for. If I had a superpower, it would be that any food that I ate could have like good nutritional properties. So maybe that could be covered by a spell. Yeah, and I guess we can talk a little bit about magic in general in the Harry Potter world. Harry Potter is definitely what we'd call a soft magic system where the rules of the magic are not defined at all. Like Dumbledore can do pretty much anything. It's unclear exactly what his limits are. Harry Potter, we know he goes to classes. We know the spells that he knows, but his power level varies kind of depending on what the plot requires. So this is in contrast to an author like Brandon Sanderson, who you've probably heard about on the podcast, where his magic is very strictly defined. Like, you know, depending on how much Stormlight someone has, they can do these abilities. And if they're in this order of the Knight's Radiant or whatever, like these are their powers. So something like that is very well defined. Harry Potter is very, very much more a Lord of the Rings style magic where the wizards can do the cool magic. And it just depends on what the plot is requiring. And that's fine. Different stories kind of uh, lend themselves to different types of magic. And Harry Potter does a really good job of the way that the magic is structured because you always know what the spells are and they're cool and they're fun. And we feel like, I mean, how many times have you pointed a light switch 
and said, Alohomora. N- no, incorrect. I knew that was, I knew that was wrong as soon as I said it. Yeah, yeah, my bad. Lumos. Lumos, right? Or yeah. Accio. I think, you know, Accio keys or something, right? It's totally, it's ingrained in society almost. So that's how well the magic is. Steven, can you take the Alohomora error out of the podcast? We'll see. I feel like I just lost a lot of credibility. No, if you can come up with the spell to, re- to remove my memory, I will do it. It's in the second book. Professor Lockhart specializes in this spell. It's Obliviate. Oh, it's Obliviate, duh. Yeah, right. Ron's, uh, Ron's wand that is broken in half luckily backfires the, the spell back on Lockhart. Yeah, that's another thing. The Wizarding World should definitely have something better to fix wands. It seems like a big... A big Achilles heel to a wizard, right? If your yeah. wand were to snap. Breaks the wand, you have to get a new one. Yeah, and I don't understand why, and this goes with the first book as well, and see, and we can get back to the magic too, but why do the why do the Weasleys have to be so poor that their house is falling apart? I don't get how they can't mend that with magic. And I know that Arthur is working his tail off at the ministry, learning about muggles, even though he doesn't understand, even though his whole life is devoted to learning about the muggles, he still doesn't understand how their stuff works. But... Do you guys have any, this is a question that I've had, why do the Weasleys have to be so poor that they can't even afford a, a wand for their son? He's just wasting his time at magic school because he can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so you think that Arthur should be taking home more money or that they should just be more frugal or, or what? Well, I think that, and this probably goes against some ethical rules, but you could use magic to somehow produce or perform a skill that would be beneficial to muggles and you could earn muggle money and then go to Gringotts, we learn, that you can exchange that money for galleons and whatnot. Like, there's got to be a way for wizards to... I don't, I don't see how there could be any poor wizards. Yeah, be creative with your powers. They should be growing crops super quickly or making extra delicious food yeah. or, or sewing clothes really fast or something Yeah, that's like a that. good idea. Yeah, sewing clothes. Like, how hard is it to make some robes? And those costs those cost a pretty penny in Diagon Alley, we learn. Well, I mean, Ron does get the uh, the old dress robes in fourth year, right? Save some money there. <laughs> I guess the Weasley just being poor, it makes them more endearing and kind of gets you on their side a little bit more. But when I think about it more, I don't really see why that has to be the case. Yeah, and she, I think she purposely, J.K. Rowling purposely stays away from using magic to solve too many problems because then you run into more and more plot holes like this where you say well wait they use magic to sew clothes really fast so why couldn't they use it for something else so she really just leaves it super open-ended as to what magic can do and what it can't do so that way you pretty much just have to believe the narrative that she tells you in the books and you can't really think too much about these things we can speculate on what plot holes may or may not exist and that's a good one but there's no like solid evidence where you say well well wait in third book they did this so they should be able to do this she really tries to avoid those situations. Also, I feel like if Ron would, grew up with money, he would end up a l- little bit more like Draco. A lot more spoiled, rich, bratty kid. I like that. The Weasleys would just be the Gryffindor version of the of what the Malfoys are to the Slytherins? Yeah. Not, not like evil, per se, but just super prideful, like, hey, I have all this money. Yeah, like a Cormac McLaggen type guy? Yeah. So you don't think they would be as exclusive or you think they'd be still be sympathetic to the muggles though? Because isn't that just what sets apart the Malfoys and the Weasleys is kind of their attitude towards muggles? Well, I think that's what separates like Gryffindor and Slytherin. Aren't the Weasleys and Malfoys just opposites in every possible way? Big family, small family, hair color, hair length, <laughs> athletic ability, I guess Drake. Well, I mean, some of the Weasleys are good at Quidditch. What else we have? I mean, just well, they're both purebreds. Money in general, yeah, yeah. I guess that's the only thing that they're both long, uh, long-lived wizarding families. But they're totally opposites in every other way. Yeah, they're definitely foils. I don't think Harry and Ron would end up being best friends if Ron was a snobby, rich, bratty kid. Yeah, for sure not. For sure not. So another issue that I have kind of is why do the why is the wizarding world so hesitant to accept? anything from the muggle world why did they turn their nose up at any muggle technology because i see several instances where something like an atm could be could come in handy something just like a telephone could be extremely useful like they really need to update their owl mailing system and maybe and the muggles have obviously advanced past that 
and found quicker ways to communicate. By this time, the early 90s email was starting. It seems like the younger generation, similar to what we see in our modern muggle world, the younger generation of wizards maybe should be embracing some technology things. The older generation should be the staunch opposition to this, right? Yeah. Like that should, that, should ha- that should be happening. The younger wizards should be trying to use the technology. But yeah, you don't, you don't see that at all, right? Because the younger generations are still just completely against any, any muggle type things. You don't ever have people like trying to use guns or, or muggle money or email or any of these things that makes life easier for everyone else. They're just all about magic, magic over might, and we're going to continue to keep the muggles at an arm's length. Yeah, I could see, I could definitely see where the owl mailing system can can definitely be problematic with if there's a huge battle going on or if you need help and you have to send an owl and it takes a whole day to get to your friends or something. I guess that's when you use flu powder. Flu powder is kind of the equivalent of a, of a video chat. But what if you don't have a chimney available yeah. or a fireplace, I mean? Right, there, there's a lot of issues. Yeah, and I just realized that now that I was, my mind has been dwelling on owls. I think Hedwig is one of my least favorite characters in the book. I feel like Hedwig is totally unnecessary, and I think J.K. Rowling is trying to force me to like Hedwig, but I don't. I just I don't care about Hedwig at all. Hedwig could have died, and I wouldn't have cared at all. Hedwig did die. Did you care? No. I, I sorry. I was thinking of the first book. Hedwig dies saving Carrie's life, and I still didn't care. The owls are kind of fun, though. I, Hedwig's a beautiful animal. Beautiful snowy owl? Yeah, H- Harry has the coolest owl compared to Ron's owls. <laughs> Ron's old owl, Errol, and P- Pigwidgeon. Or his rat. Yeah, Harry's animals are way cooler. Well, in Fantastic Beasts, you find out that there are some more interesting animals than owls. But for some reason, they're not available to the students. Yeah, and in the first book especially, we really just get a glimpse of what is available to us magically and in the wizarding world, and then in later books, she J.K. Rowling starts to kind of roll out more and more. In the first book, you have uh, things that are kind of more self-contained in that book, and then the larger plot starts to open up. But in later books, you have things like uh, Time Turners are a great example. In the third book, it's really important for that book, but then it's hardly mentioned at all for the rest of the series. And each book kind of has their own individual arcs, their own individual plot elements that are really important for those books. And then later on, maybe not quite as much, and that's that's an interesting way to make the uh, the stories episodic, but also uh, but also continuous in that there's a larger storyline and they're trying to defeat Voldemort the whole time. Yeah, and the first book is definitely just some foundational things, like all of the magic that they do is very basic. For example, the magic that they have to perform to complete the challenges to reach the Sorcerer's Stone. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts about those. How each professor puts in a different stage that you have to pass. Yeah, it's kind of a fun thing, but if you really think about it, you wonder why did they choose to do this? Because it sounds like a terrible security system. I thought it seemed like a decent idea because the Sorcerer's Stone is so powerful that you don't just want to have one wizard in charge of it. Like maybe not even Dumbledore, even though he's the epitome of goodness. Maybe he could go bad, like a Ring of Power situation in Lord of the Rings or something. So I like the idea of divvying up the protection. It's just the protections are so weak. Yeah, I feel like if Dumbledore were to go bad, he could easily get past the the security systems. Yeah, really, any competent wizard is going to make it past. A bunch of first years make it through. I mean, they all, all three of them, use their strengths to make through the challenges. Yeah, maybe some more advanced magic should have been required because really, several of the challenges had no magic at all required to get through. Them. Yeah, should we, should we recap what the challenges are? So this is at the end of the first year. They finally realize, well, they're still suspecting Snape at this point, but they realize that Fluffy has been compromised. And so, of course, they just rush off uh, and try to get to the Sorcerer's Stone themselves because they know Dumbledore's gone. Well, no, they first go look for Dumbledore. Well, right. They look for Dumbledore. Once they realize he's gone, they're like, oh, crap, Snape's going for the stone. We got to stop him. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one is that plant that they fall into, that death plant, the... The devil snare. After Fluffy. Right. So the fluffy challenge, no magic required. You just have to know the secret. Yep. I guess care of magical creatures. So knowledge is required, but there's no magical spell casting ability. I mean, you do have to get past the locked door. Well, right, but you just do an Alhamora. Yeah, but first years don't know that. The only reason they knew that was because Hermione read books. 
Yeah, but it's a super basic spell. Any competent wizard knows a lot, uh, a lot more. They've probably done it a million times. Okay, so then you have the Devil Snare, and then because uh, it's different in the book versus the movie. In the book, you have to not struggle and you'll make it through. But in the in the movie, they have to cast Lumos, right? Well, they have to save Ron. Yeah, Ron's freaking out, of course, because Ron doesn't know anything. Uh huh. And so in the book, they just relax and they get through. But then in, in the in the movie, they cast the light, right? Yeah, but it's not just Lumos. It's another spell that, again, Hermione comes up with. Or actually in the book, I think Hermione summons some magical fire. Yeah, that it's the same in the movie. It's yeah, they definitely Lumos. need the fire. Okay, good to know it's not just Lumos. And then you have the flying keys that are charmed by Professor Flitwick. So once again, no spellcasting ability required here. You just have to be able to fly a broom. So, I mean, I guess that narrows out a lot of wizards that maybe have not flown brooms before. Hermione probably wouldn't have been able to do it on her own. That's true. And then the wizarding chess, which, yeah, as you're saying this, Stephen, I'm realizing no magic required again. Same, same exact thing as muggle chess, just higher stakes. Yeah, shouldn't, have, shouldn't McGonagall, the transfiguration teacher, look, transfiguration seems like a more advanced class. Like not every student is going to be good at transfiguration. And there's a lot of room for maybe some nuances of magical theory or something in transfiguration. But all we're doing is playing chess. How is that McGonagall's challenge? Can't she do better than that? For sure. Like make it at least the it, a little bit harder. So a bunch of 11 year olds can't win. And Ron is a chess prodigy. I'm not believing that. I'm sorry. He's not smart in any other ways. Yeah, not buying it either. But yeah, that's pr- that's probably the only time McGonagall disappointed me in the first book. Not when she sends Ron, Harry, and Hermione and Draco to the Forbidden Forest for detention. I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt there. I'm assuming that she just thought she was sending them to Hagrid for other things and didn't know the severity of the situation. So Hagrid was the one who... <laughs> Who made the dumb decision to send them off into the forest? No, no. She she sent them to detention with Hagrid. Why didn't she just have them be in detention with her? Yeah, I feel like McGonagall, McGonagall knew what was, she what was gonna know. happen. Also, why didn't she stop Ron, Harry, and Hermione from after they asked where Dumbledore is? Like, why didn't she ask, why do you need to know where no Dumbledore is? What's going on? They told her that they knew that Snape was going to get the stone. She asked them how they knew about the stone and they confessed everything. But yeah, she didn't stop him or anything. I mean, she might have been the one that got Dumbledore to come back. Okay, so the other challenges were the mountain troll, which had already been defeated by Quirrell. Probably a good thing because no way Ron, Harry, and Hermione would have made it past the second yeah. troll, I don't <laughs> yeah. think. Then you had the logic test with the potions by Snape. Yeah, I really liked this little logic puzzle. Yeah, did, I found myself reading back over it. To see, well, the first time I, I breezed through, I remember breezing through and just getting to the conclusion. But then after Hermione had the answer, I went back and read the hints and said, oh, was it really possible to, to decipher that based on the, on the clues? Yeah, I think based off of the text of the book, you can't fully solve the puzzle. But you're left to believe that Hermione did some stuff like off screen, off text, yeah. if you will, to, to find the answer. I would have definitely loved that part in the movie. Yeah, maybe it doesn't make for a great movie thing like... Just showing a logic puzzle is not going to draw in a ton of viewers, but it was fun in the book. It could be a good montage of different various Hermione thinking poses while Harry just sits off to the side. And Ron's picking his nose or something? Well, Ron was defeated. Oh, yeah, Ron's, Ron's defeated. Ron's just dead in a rubble <laughs> of stone chess Ron pieces. Ron gave a sacrifice <laughs> himself. Yeah, he somehow forged a connection with the knight that he was riding on, and he was severely damaged by its defeat. Yeah. Not explained. And then the last one was the mirror itself, or the mirror of Erised. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, the, close enough. And we're, we're going with that. Yeah, have you guys heard about, so the idea is that no one could acquire the Sorcerer's Stone unless, or if they were planning on using it for themselves, they couldn't acquire it? Yeah. So why was Quirrell not able to acquire it if his whole plan was just to immediately give it to Voldemort? Because him and Voldemort were Are they the same? the same person at that point. Okay. I think he says, I see myself in the mirror presenting my master with the stone, but why can I not get it? Because his greatest desire was to give it to... Yeah, I don't know. It, you're right. It doesn't quite make sense. It, it, this is another soft magic thing that we just have to go along with for plot reasons. Yeah, and it works out pretty well. The Thinking back over the story, though, I was wondering if Harry, Ron, and Hermione 
hadn't gone into the chamber themselves, what would have, well, Quirrell would have just been left there for an unknown amount of time, for an indeterminable amount of time until he just gave up at the mirror. So he would have never even acquired it anyway. Yeah, maybe eventually Voldemort figures something out and yeah. is able to come up with a new way, a new approach to get the stone. Unclear, though. Yeah, that's that's what the case has to be for Harry, Ron, and Hermione's journey to have been worth it. Because otherwise, eventually Dumbledore would have come back and he would have brought his squad with him into the chamber. And then they would have had a showdown with Quirrell right there. And for all we know, the, so the entire Voldemort thing could have just ended right there. Like, mm -hmm. that's a how it should have ended thing. Not really. They could have just caught we, Voldemort. Well, they'd later find out that Voldemort is... Yeah, they still wouldn't have been able to defeat the Horcruxes in that way. But yeah, they definitely would have like isolated his soul piece. I, I don't know exactly how it would have worked. But yeah, maybe a, maybe a how it should have ended YouTube video like this exists. Another muggle thing that could have helped is just an alarm on the door system, on the door underneath Fluffy. Yeah, the uh, the professor for muggle studies, if she had a challenge, that challenge would have been killer. 99% of wizards would have been completely clueless. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> okay, we, we talked quite a bit about the series in general, some first book, but let's go into power rankings, power rankings specific to just the first book. So I want to hear you guys' top three, and this is fun to do for a series because book to book, it will change quite a bit depending on how the character did in the book, but go off whatever criteria you want. My criteria is like performance, so which characters do I feel did the best jobs for themselves as characters? Um, give me top three, bottom three. Let's start with top three, starting with Nathan. My top three, uh, number one, would be Hermione as she helps Harry and Ron several times throughout the series and saves them several times as they go throughout the trials at the end of the book. Uh, number two, we would probably have to be either... I would, I, I'm going to go with Harry, just because he, at the end of the day, saves the day. I mean, he stops Voldemort. Uh, number three, oh man, it's a tough one. Are you just going to choose Ron to complete the trio? No, no, no. Ron Ron doesn't do anything. I, I do not like Ron as a character whatsoever. I think Ron's got to make the top three in the fifth book, though. Mm, yeah, that's, where he, that's when he really comes into his own. Anyways, number three for book one would probably, probably have to be, I don't know, like a Snape. So I, I'm going to go with Snape just because he catches on to Quirrell early on in the book and stops him early on when he releases the troll into Hogwarts. Okay, nice. Dan, let's hear your top three. Yeah, I'm going to go with Hermione's at number one for me for sure. And I'm just astonished at how well she acclimates to the wizarding world considering she had no previous exposure and she immediately becomes the most impressive first year. And that for me, she also shows a nice character arc where she's really stubborn and do good at the beginning, but then she quickly realizes that it's better to have friends than just abide by every rule. Number two is going to be McGonagall. And I like McGonagall's character. I think this might be influenced by the movies and Mag Maggie Stone, but also in the book, she's a really cool character. And she identifies Harry's Quidditch talent, which I think is very important. Also, I forgot to mention this in the Quidditch section. Are we concerned that Harry kind of threw away some potential goat level Quidditch talent in order to become an Auror and to just defeat the Dark Arts? Was his true calling maybe, could he have devoted more time to Quidditch? I'm saying in his adult life. If we know he's such a prodigy. Yeah, maybe Ginny was concerned about the safety, you know, maybe CTE or some, some serious injuries that yeah. he might sustain yeah. in a Quidditch career. Kind of dissuaded him. I don't know if an aura is any safer of a line of work. I think Harry wanted to follow his parents with their work and just be an aura. Yeah, maybe he just got a huge rush out of defeating Voldemort, something that he'd never experienced on the Quidditch pitch before, and he needed to chase that. Okay, and for my number three, I need your help on this, guys. Give me a couple names. I'm having a hard time coming up with number three. I don't want it to be Harry, Ron, Hagrid. I'm finding that I, I dislike a lot of characters in the first book. How about maybe a Neville Longbottom? Yeah, I'm going to go with Neville at number three. Yeah, I like Neville. What about you, about Steven? Any, any reasons? Just the 10 house points at the end? The, the lovable uh, character that isn't good at anything? Even worse than Ron? Yeah, now I'm second guessing my Neville <laughs> pick, actually. 
You like Trevor the Toad? <laughs> Trevor the Toad. <laughs> Trevor. All right, it's too late. It's too late. You're locked in with Neville at three. <laughs> My top three, number one is Snape for the same reasons that Nathan referenced. He was the only one who really caught on to Quirrell. Quirrell and Voldemort had fooled everyone else, including Dumbledore, the greatest wiz- wizard of all time, or so we we're supposed to believe. Hermione's number two for the same reasons you guys mentioned. She's super smart and comes in really well for an 11-year-old considering she's been raised by muggles. Number three, I'm going Voldemort slash Quirrell, kind of referencing what I was Ooh. talking about earlier, because he gets really close to coming back really early on and tricks everyone except for a bunch of first-year students. So Voldemort does really well for himself, unfortunately not able to make it all the way through and get the W, but he does get all the way to the finish line. So that's that's worthy of a top three finish. He didn't really trick them. They all thought it was Snape. Yeah, that would be tricking. Because they thought it was someone else. Yeah, but if they didn't think it was Snape and didn't catch on, he would have been down there forever. Yeah, I think that's something that J.K. Rowling does really well, is that a lot of the characters, you feel like you know them so well, and you fall into the sense of security with predicting how they're going to act in certain situations. And then she'll throw you for a loop on just like one or two characters per book. Like in this book, it was Quirrell and Snape that had surprise endings. Everyone else, you learn very early on exactly what their character is. Like Malfoy is a character of evil and Harry's always going to be good, as we know, and um, and the rest of the main characters. But Quirrell and Snape really surprise. All right, so let's do a bottom three quick, Nathan. Who are your bottom three? My bottom three are Dumbledore, McGonagall, and Hagrid. So three of the the Gryffindor heroes, if you will. Three of the adult <laughs> Gryffindor heroes. Yeah. Just didn't do it for you in this book, huh? I mean, McGonagall sends them to detention in the Forbidden Forest. Hagrid then separates them, separates the Chosen One, Harry, in the Forbidden Forest with Malfoy, who does not like Harry. What about Hagrid Hagrid giving away the secret to getting past Fluffy? There's also that. And then Dumbledore just leaves at Hogwarts and doesn't do anything. I mean, if you're an all-time... If I was Dumbledore, I would at least teach a class or something. Be involved with the students more. Yeah, what does Dumbledore actually do day to day? To sit in his office? Just pours over tomes about Voldemort? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, Dan, do you have a, t- a bottom three? Yeah, I do have my bottom three ready. My bottom three are Dumbledore number one. I did not like Dumbledore at all in the first book. He didn't earn his uh, acclaim as the best wizard of all time for me in the first book. I didn't see a lot of evidence of that. I'm also going to pick Fluffy in my bottom three. And I'm going to pick Snape. Oh. Mm. Snape was my number one in my top three. Yeah. Why are you picking Snape? I don't really care about like who wins or whatever. And I don't really care that he's a secret agent, but I would. he's just so mean to everyone for the in- entirety of the book that I, I can't really like him. I can't really like his character. And I like him even less when I find out the reason for some of his pettiness towards Harry is stemming from like the previous generation. So... I didn't like Snape. I didn't like Fluffy because he's way too easy to get past. So that was kind of disappointing for me for Fluffy. Okay, solid bottom three. No surprises for me. I'm going number one, Dumbledore, for the same reasons. He was just not impressive in the first book. Number two is Hagrid. Ha- Look, Hagrid has some good moments when he comes to when he comes to uh, get Harry for the first time from the Dursleys. But he goes downhill f- fast from there. He's just totally inept, just kind of duffing around all the time and doesn't really know anything. We, we get a sense that maybe he can do some magic, but not really sure why or, or how. And he gives away the crucial secrets and is just totally irresponsible. And I get that he's kind of a fun guy, fun to be around, good father figure to Harry a little bit. Or maybe he's not a good father figure, but Harry wants yeah, him to maybe be. Maybe that fun uncle type of feel for yeah, Harry. Yeah, the, the fun uncle that's just totally irresponsible, as many of Harry's guardians are, unfortunately. And then the third, I'm going just the Dursleys. All three Dursleys were bottom three just because they were totally ridiculous and did a really poor job of raising Harry and being like realistic human beings at all, which makes them good, fun characters for the role they were put in, but they just did a really poor job in the book. I like I like Uncle or I like Vernon Dursley a little bit. I admire his I admire his diligence in trying to avoid the the letters of acceptance like he packing up his packing up his whole family on a whim and going to this remote island but D- dudley and petunia don't seem to show much of a backbone at all 
Fair point. Okay, thanks, guys. I think that wraps our conversation about Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Thanks for chatting with me. If you like the content we're putting out, check us out on social media at Phantology Books and online at www.phantologybooks.com. And if fans like this episode, we will continue going through Harry Potter. We just kind of did this as a fun one-off to get us through these boring days of self-quarantine. But uh, but let us know what you're looking forward to, and we'll try to hit those series more. So, Dan, Nathan, thanks. It's been fun, guys. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, nice time. All right, see you everyone later. <laughs>